Hi everyone, welcome. Thank you for coming to the GLBT Historical Society Museum. Uh, welcome to the opening reception of the mayor of Folsom Street. Thank Yay. you so much for being here. I call this our small but powerful museum. Jordy Jones' new book, The Mayor of Folsom Street, um, which we have here in the, in the front. Uh, and Gail's book also, Deviations, is, is up in the front as well. Um, so with that, I just want to like introduce uh, two wonderful people. Um, uh, who curate, co-curated uh, this uh, lovely exhibit about a wonderful man that many of you knew. Uh, I did not know Alan personally. Uh, I read the book, um, and uh, but I and I admire him uh, immensely. I think he's one of the one of the uh, uh, heroes of the LGBTQ uh, community in San Francisco, and it's so important to showcase his story as as a window into a leather culture. I think, and so. Jeremy Prince couldn't be here tonight. He was our former museum director and co-curated the exhibit uh, with uh, Gail Rubin. Gail is one of the founders of the GLBT Historical Society, and, and I just want to give Gail a big hand for all the work that she does. Yeah. Yeah. Gail is also co-chair of our uh, National Advisory Council. She's involved in the uh, Letter Cultural District in San Francisco as, uh, and has been a mentor to me, uh, gives me uh, great advice, and even tonight she was bending my ear about something that can, uh, I think, make a difference in our work. And so I, uh, I love her and honor her tremendously as uh, really the go-to academic about leather history in, in the world. And yeah. so, so uh, I'm, I'm delighted to have Gail, and I'm going to ask Gail to come up and speak in just a second. And Jordy Jones, uh, who has also been involved in the Historical Society uh, for many years, and uh, uh, is the author of The Mayor of Folsom Street, which really precipitated this exhibit, um, and brought to us the archives uh, that uh, he collected as Daddy Boy. Uh, 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 or uh, the Historical Society Archives, so those, those will be a resource. We're very proud to have those collections, along with many other leather collections um, uh, that we brought into uh, our archives. And so uh, with that, which one am I bringing up here first? I think Jordy first. <laughs> Let's give a big hand to Jordy Jones. <laughs> Thank you, Terry. I'm uh, really distracted by what's going on on this uh, video screen over there, so I'm just going to turn my back to it. And I'm not much on impromptu public speaking, so I'm going to give you just a few minutes here. And mainly what I would like to say is thank you all so much, so much for coming out tonight. Alan, Alan would be so touched to see this. Thank you. And absolutely, the world's premier leather historian, Dr. Gail Rubin. Jordy, you were supposed to speak longer. <laughs> I told you. I'm no good at impromptu either, so I have notes, and it's going to be hard to hold my notes and hold this microphone, so bear with me. Um, you want a note holder? Yeah, sure. Chris, <laughs> 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 It's like having, you know, That's how that works. concert pianist and having someone do the sheet music. Sure. Concert pianist, right. a minor American composer. Uh, so, mm -hmm. you know, like that. That's, no, so I can see it. Anyway, um, I just want to say something about the Historical Society. Um, I've been involved in the queer archives business since uh, the late 1970s. And back in those days, we're not here yet. Okay. Anyway. Uh, back in those days, you know, it was the, the big sex wars, and SM was quite controversial, and there were debates about whether or not various archives, uh, archival projects, would even collect SM materials. Mm -hmm. And um, in fact, we had a split in the old gay history project here uh, over the issue of SM, and uh, uh, a group peeled off uh, to do a different project. 
but the GLBTHS, which grew out of it, uh, the history project, has always been weather friendly from the get go. And that's really amazing. We have huge leather collections, and I'm very happy about that. Anyway, first I want to uh, thank some people about this exhibit. Uh, the inimitable Jordy Jones, who literally wrote the book on Alan Selby, which you can buy up front. Jordy is a gentleman and a scholar, and he has been instrumental in collecting a lot of archives and getting them to Safe Harbor at the GLBTHS, including uh, all the material that he collected uh, from and on Alan Selby himself. And he got that material together and lovingly placed it at the GLBTHS. Uh, for future generations, Jordy, thank you so much for doing that, the book Bye. and the archives. <laughs> and Jeremy Prince, who isn't here because he and his lover have just moved down to Southern California, but he was instrumental in putting this exhibit together and did a lot of the work in, uh, in, in uh, uh, the curation process. And he also um, uh, was involved in, uh, in the installation. And I want to thank the whole exhibit and installation team. If you're here, please uh, give a wave. Um, in addition to Jeremy, we have the fabulous Elizabeth Cornu. <laughs> Ramon, Ramon Silvestri, Woo! Jeff Raby, Lene Adu, Gerard Koskovich, Woo! Mark Sawchuk, uh, and I hope I'm pronouncing everybody's name, uh, uh, Valeria Lannis, Angela Maria Ting, Nalini uh, uh, Elias, and uh, of course, Terry Beswick, our wonderful executive director. Uh, and then we got to thank Alan Selby himself, without whose amazing life we would not be here tonight. Celebrating. <laughs> Over the years, I've worked with Alan Selby on a range of projects and committees and fundraisers and this and that, and so many I don't even remember them. But I wouldn't have expected any of that when I first heard that he was coming to town to open a leather store. I heard about this from Cynthia Slater. Uh, and I'm not sure how Cynthia knew about this, but she pretty much used to be the local leather town crier. And she knew everything and everyone. And uh, so she said, this man from England is coming to open a, a leather store. Uh, and uh, then I met Alan soon after he arrived also because of Cynthia. We were at some leather event and Cynthia introduced us. So I met this British gentleman with this wonderful accent. Uh, and that would have been sometime in 1979. And I can't help but say a little bit about the history of leather retail in San Francisco, which at that time was mostly in the Polk, which may surprise people. <laughs> but the Polk in the 60s, before the Castro really took off, was the gay retail corridor of San Francisco. So the leather shops were like most of the gay retail. They were on Polk Street, and there were two of them that were uh, major ones, Leather World and Leather Forever. I don't know if any of you remember those. Yeah. Yes. yes. And then uh, both of them opened uh, uh, short-lived satellite shops here in the Castro in the early 80s. Also over in the Polk, there was a, a guy named Tauber, Taubers of California, and he didn't have a storefront, but he had an upstairs fitting room. And that was where all the serious bikers went to get their riding apparel. They would go to Tauber. And South of Market, there was Taste of Leather, which was the first leather store uh, in, in San Francisco. And there was always, yeah, run by this guy, Nicodemus. He started upstairs at Phoebe's, and then he moved uh, to the trading post down on Folsom, and then he moved to... 6th Street, it was, went, he was in a lot of places. Then he sold it, and there were about three more locations. Uh, but there was also a guy named Joe Taylor, uh, who had a place called Taylor of San Francisco. He was a small-scale craftsman who basically worked out of the garage of his apartment on Clementina. But when Alan opened Mr. S at his original location on 7th Street near Howard, he helped tip the balance. And within a few years, the shops on Polk Street were gone, and the center of leather retail gravity uh, had shifted decisively to South of Market, where it is to this day. Partly because Mr. S has become such a gigantic, amazing uh, emporium. Uh, 
both the store, Mr. S, and Alan, Mr. S, have had really, wait a minute, you're a little ahead of me. Oh, sorry. <laughs> it's okay, you're doing a great job. Have really large blueprints locally, nationally, and internationally, and the store has just become one of the, I mean, it's like the, the, the Macy's and Bloomingdale's of Latin America. <laughs> Uh, and they also, of course, do an enormous amount of production. It's not just the retail floor, it's all the stuff that they make behind, uh, behind the scenes. And Alan, of course, Alan himself was an ubiquitous figure, especially during the AIDS epidemic, when he threw himself into raising prodigious amounts of money for AIDS services and AIDS organizations. And in order to do this, he spawned all sorts of events, including these Leather Daddy and Boy contests, and my favorite event of his, the signature fetish and fantasy extravaganza, and I was so happy there's a flyer for fetish and fantasy up in the exhibit. Uh, and that was like a thing where it started off at the brig and then it moved over to 1015, I forget whatever the name was of the club at the time, but people would come and do demos and raise money and it was just, it was a big party. Anyway, uh, but I want to talk about one other thing Alan did, which is one of my favorite memories, and that's his auctions. In order to raise money for AIDS, Alan started to hold pretty regular auctions, mostly out on the Eagle patio, and they did something in addition to raising money. They had other really important impacts. Among them, the redistribution and preservation of leather material culture, much of which would have otherwise been lost during the epidemic. Early in the epidemic, a lot of the men who started to sicken and die did not have wills. They were too young to have thought about estate planning. So they died intestate. And when people die without wills, their heirs, their legal heirs, are their legal next of kin. And since there was no gay marriage at this point, most of those legal next of kin were parents and siblings. And uh, many of whom were either revolted by the sex toys and leather gear, or they had no clue as to its aesthetic or historical value. So things such as leather art and posters and letters and ephemera, huge amounts of this stuff ended up in dumpsters. So this was in the early 80s, but what happened as Alan started to get these auctions more established is that the surviving partners of people who had died would donate their leather estates, in effect, to Alan to use at these auction fundraisers. So, he got amazing amounts of leather clothing and sex toys and art and artifacts. And through these auctions, these items found new homes, but they also helped to fund organizations such as the AIDS Emergency Fund. But other people got to use and treasure these items. So it, it really kind of recycled all of this stuff. And after a while, Alan began to realize that some of these donated items were historically significant and that their historical value exceeded their monetary value. So he'd often call me up and he'd say, hey, I have this vest and it's covered with pins and buttons. Would you like to have it? And then there was the time he called to tell me he had this collection of about 30 bike club banners from all over the world. They were from the US, they were from Australia, they were from France, they were from England, uh, they were from all over the place. And they had been collected by one of the New York Motorcycle Clubs, the Cycle MC, and whenever they would have an event with another club, they'd exchange banners. So the Cycle MC had collected about 30 or 40 of these amazing banners, and the last surviving custodian of these was living in Vallejo, and he needed to get rid of them. So he called Alan, and Alan called me, and I got the banners, and then Elizabeth Cornu helped me pack them up properly, because she's a museum conservation professional, and we shipped them off to the Leather Archives and Museum, where they are to this day, and one of them I was thrilled to know it was from the 69 Club from London, which was a crucial club and one to which Alan himself had belonged. So among his less recognized contributions was this redistribution of leather goods and his saving a lot of critical primary source material for leather history, most of which has ended up either at the Leather Archives in Chicago or in the collections of the GLBT Historical Society right here in San Francisco. I have a lot of fond memories of Alan and appreciation for his many activities, but of all the things he did, I am most grateful for the, uh, for the way he came to understand the importance of salvaging these pieces of leather history and making sure that they ended up in safe havens in archival institutions that could take care of them and make them available to future generations. And I suspect this is a side of Alan that most people did not experience.
uh, but it was one that I particularly treasure. And it also makes this exhibit extremely especially fitting as Alan has now taken his own place as part of leather history. So I want to thank again the people who made this possible, uh, especially Jordy and Jeremy and the entire exhibits and installation team, but also the sponsors, Mr. S. Weather. Yeah. <laughs> and Folsom Street Events. And David Hyman. <laughs> David had to leave, but Race Bannon. Race, are you still here? Yes, <laughs> and all of those who made this, this uh, wonderful exhibit possible. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Steve and uh, Gaines, and I was a uh, San Francisco Leather Daddy 12. And we have uh, Leather Daddy was Alan Selby's organization. He created it. He, we raised a lot of money, and it was his thing, and I was very proud to be a part of it. Um, I want to present to Terry for the, for the LGBT Historic, Historical Society uh, a plaque from the Leather Daddy's Boy. They're also going to get the Leather Daddy's plaque, and we want that to be part of the history of San Francisco. Thank you. I just want to reiterate uh, our thanks to Folsom Street Events and Mr. S. Leather. Thank you so much for your support. Um, Race Bannon, David Hyman, uh, Christo, thanks for holding the paper for Gail to read. This guy, he looks so straight laced, but he's the like, kinkiest guy. Ever. Anyway. Um, and thank you all for coming. Please enjoy uh, wine, cheese, and what have you, and come again. Thank you so much.